Good evening and welcome to the Taco Society Presents. Uh, our hosts tonight are Sydney, Phil, and we're missing Guard. Guard had some uh, family matters to attend to, so it's just going to be the three of us tonight, which gives us a chance to talk about ourselves uh, without Guard. Mm -hmm. so, uh, he, uh, all his secrets are safe tonight, but ours mm -hmm. aren't. <laughs> <laughs> so, Phil, why don't you uh, start us off and uh, let us know what's new in your life. What's going on? Uh, well, well, I do have some news that's directly related to the Taco Society. Great. Before I even talk about myself or any of uh, us. But uh, one of our guests, um, Dan Sesney, has had a new book that has been picked up and is going to be uh, published next year, June 2016, and it's called Mosquito Rain, Alaskan Travel Essays by Folded Word Press, which I yep. believe is out of uh, Wilton, and, and um, he let everybody know about a week ago. Yes. And I was talking to Dan last night, and uh, he mentioned that, and he's also a co-host of a radio show that he yes, appears on every two weeks, talking mm -hmm. about food, of all things, bizarre food, Yeah. so uh, us local people at least can hear it, and uh, I'm not sure if... Uh, if it's going to be on YouTube or not. But if you're fans of uh, Dan, uh, check out the new book coming out. Uh, uh, June 2016. Next year right. yep. in, uh, in the radio show. Yep, exactly. What else you got? Well, um, uh, a few things. Um, uh, first off, um, uh, I've, I've moved on to other things as well, which is um, I'm designing covers now. And I actually designed oh, one you. completely from scratch. I do have it here. Now, this um, is for uh, great old ones? It is, actually. Um, uh, but um, I could do it for anybody, of course. But uh, this here is called uh, Sasquatch Lake by Eric S. Brown. Uh, he's an author. The Bigfoot guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an author from uh, North Carolina who actually uh, had a movie that just came out last year uh, starring C. Thomas Howell. Exists? Uh, no, no, he no. Did, this one was called Bigfoot Wars. Oh, uh, okay. It came out the same time, though. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, but I, it's interesting you brought that up because I have something about that as well later. Um, and so what, what happened was... Um, uh, he has, has this book published here, and I was uh, the person that developed the, the cover uh, from scratch. Good. And Good. so um, that was exciting. Uh, the back cover actually um, is a picture of uh, Unkanuk Mountain, one of the trails. I actually uh, took that picture. You were just and there. I was, yes, there? yes. This, um, I, I try to hike that every so often uh, during the summer. And uh, so Goffstown is... <laughs> on the cover, back cover of this. We're book. famous. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, so that's that's somewhat exciting. Uh, uh, Good to, for you. Yeah, yeah, it was fun do, uh, doing that. Um, uh, a couple other things. Um, I have a uh, new short story that um, was accepted this morning. As a matter of fact, I sent the contract, and and uh, further details will be released. Sure. But at this time. I'm not supposed well, to Congratulations. Divulge. But yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. I think it was a pretty good story. Great. Uh, I wrote it last week. Yeah, I read it. It was a good story. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. I'm going um, to read it tonight. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, and then uh, one other thing uh, is I've discovered that one of my short stories is going to be in a graphic novel. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, the artist Ogmius out of uh, Rhode Island Great. does yeah. a uh, graphic novel yearly called Summerlands. And, uh, Wicked Tales. He yeah, did he, he did the cover yeah. of that, as a matter of fact, Ogmius. Yeah. And uh, he, he t uh, decided to do uh, a story that um, he liked a lot that I um, um, wrote. And Congratulations again. Yeah, yeah so that, that'll be um, pretty cool. So, yeah, that's, that's what's going on now. And, of course, I'm, I'm doing the writing and things is like we all are on our side, great, trying to figure, finish things up. Sydney, what, what's up with you? Um, I just signed a contract with uh, Jim and Janice Leach of the DailyNightmare.com for their third anthology uh, in a series called, um, uh, the last one was 22 Quick Shivers, well, 22 More Quick Shivers. Um, and uh, that one was about bugs. And yeah, That's yeah. Uh, yeah, more bugs. <laughs> Sugar inducing. Um, but um, this one, uh, my piece is called In the Garden of Wood and Weevil, and it's uh, 100 words. All of them are 100 word pieces, and they're inspired by nightmares. So I just signed a contract for that. And thank yes. you. And I love working with them, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the anthology. So, Good. Good for you. Yeah. And then today I found out that um, Transference, which is the opening paragraph of Baby's Breath, was uh, was chosen as a finalist in the uh, Parsec Awards 
um, in the category of best speculative fiction audio drama um, long form. It was podcast by the Wicked Library last year um, on episode 503, which had three tales of mine, and Nelson Piles and Maddie Holiday Von Stark ran uh, that at the time. And Nelson read two of my stories and had his wife read Transference, which was great because, you know, it's told from the woman's point. Per, of view. Yeah, yeah, from the perspective of Diane, the main character. Well, it later came to be Diane. At the time, it was just a hundred words, and the character was nameless. But um, so that was exciting. It's exciting for them. The podcast is fantastic. They've been. Uh, putting out, you know, work from so many members of the community. They uh, actually have Neil Gaiman uh, on, I think, next week, I was told. So um, that's exciting. And the award ceremony is held at Dragon Con mm -hmm. in Atlanta over Labor Day weekend. So we'll find out if um, it wins. And um, You don't have too long to wait. No. But um, well, just being you going, yeah. no, I won't be going. But just being a finalist yes, is 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 amazing. It's such an honor. Yeah. Is, there's, there's no great and them. Yeah. I well, mean, they do such a good job with the podcast. It, it, it's, it's fantastic that they would choose your work too. I mean, if they're choosing Neil Gaiman, who who did Coraline, you know, and that was a movie. Never mind, mm -hmm. and they chose your story. That's fantastic. Well, yeah, they are. They 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 do a great job with that podcast, and and Maddie does artwork for it, and great. Nelson's voice is just. You you know, transfixing. He's not doing it anymore, but he still does a Halloween special. So um, uh, we'll be able to hear him again this coming Halloween with Good. stories from, I'm sure, a lot of authors that we know. So, Great. yeah. What else you got going? A lot of good news here. Uh, yeah, I am working on a very exciting project, co-writing something with someone which I'm not at liberty to discuss yet, okay. but I'll be sharing that news soon, and um, that'll be something I'm really excited to share yeah, with you guys. we can't wait to hear. Yeah, and um, aside from that, I'll be leaving for France very soon. Wee oui, wee, oui, enjoy yourself. Yeah, yeah. I will. I'm going to bring Phil a t-shirt. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, when I went uh, a few years back, I forgot to buy a t-shirt. So. Yeah. I will get you one. I'll be happy Thanks. with a bagel if you can bring me a bagel. Back. I'll try. I'll, <laughs> you, you I'll bring a you a baguette. A baguette. Yeah, yeah a baguette or yes. a croissant, okay. not a bagel. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You know me. I'm French. And I still don't know uh, anything <laughs> to do with, with so French or France. So what's with you? With me, I got a lot of things going on. Okay. Uh, I was featured in a, um, a blog review from uh, Nev Murphy called Confessions of a Reviewer. And basically what they do is they ask you uh, what book affected you in your past, uh, what books affected you presently, and what do you think you're going to be doing in the future. And you can, you can look up the, uh, the blog on the internet. It's called Confessions of a Reviewer. But uh, basically the uh, book I chose for one that affected me that I read in the past was by Chet Williamson called Ash Wednesday. The book that affected me the most recently is called Factory Town by John Ooh, Bozoff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and by I by who? John Bassoff. Bassoff, oh, yes. Yeah. I think I said Bozoff, but Bassoff. Uh, and in the future, what would I be doing? And this is supposed to be when I'm 95 years old, and I said I'd be writing erotica. And I got to do a little... <laughs> A little detail, so I can't get into it here. But if, if you uh, <laughs> want to read the review, the uh, blog, you know, feel free to uh, look it up on uh, the internet or on uh, Facebook. And just got some news right before I came here. Uh, we released the ebook version of Eulogy Three. Uh, you probably can't see it that well, but it's it's our newest anthology, edited by Christopher Jones, Nancy Calanta, and Tony Tremblay, me. Uh, it was out for released for about two hours, and it climbed to number forty in the, uh, the Kindle Horror uh, uh, ranking. So we're very, very pleased. Uh, there's some great authors in here: David Morell, Ray Garten, Brian Hodge, uh, Tim Curran. God, I could go on and on. Tom Sullivan, Ray uh, Bracken McLeod, John Everson. 
Elizabeth Massey, and now I'm going to forget somebody. I'm going to feel terrible. <laughs> but there's a lot of people and a lot of great authors. Uh, and if you can pick it up, it's only four ninety nine, and it's on Amazon, and it's called Eulogies 3. And, and is the trade paperback available as well, then? Uh, it is, and it has been for a while. Oh, okay. uh, a lot of people like the ebook because it's more it's it's uh, inexpensive. It's it's only four ninety nine if you can believe that. And if you look inside the drawings, and they come across on the ebook, so you can see the drawings on the ebook also. Mm. So that was just released. Well, uh, congratulations, John. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, very very proud of that, and as I am the other eulogies books also. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still promoting Wicked Tales, which I think I just showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, also, is anthology year three where I have a story. You can see the big A on my shirt uh, for the uh, Anthicon the anthology. Uh, and I'm working right now on a collection of my stories uh, for a publisher. Uh, and it's going to be kicking off with a brand new story uh, called The Strange Saga of Maddie Dyer. You guys may be familiar with mm -hmm. it. Uh, and it's going to end with another story. That's a novella, so it's a pretty long story. It's about 70,000 words. And the ending, if it all goes well, will be uh, another story that's never been released called The Visitor, and that's about 10,000 words. Nice. So I've been working very hard on that, and I think I'll be submitting that shortly. I'm, I'm not sure when. I still got to do some more edits. And I'm working on my uh, post-apocalyptic, did I say that right? I always screw that word up, novel called Steel. Uh, and if we get to the readings a little bit, I'll just read a little bit from that. But it's a, it's a story of of a uh, horrible thing that happened and the whole world has changed and there's only teenagers left and uh, it's it doesn't look very good for them. <laughs> yeah, so uh, don't know when that'll be released but I'm working on it now. Sounds good. Yeah working with my uh, writers group. I can't talk about enough about writers groups. I really enjoy mine and they've been helping me quite a lot with it. It's called The Blank Page out of Gosstown, New Hampshire. Anything else that's new? We all set? I might be doing a reading in New York with um, uh, the Demonic Visions crew. Just oh, great. some yeah. of them, yeah. I know Trisha Wooldridge. Um, oh, you know, she's going. Yeah, yeah. she's going to be going. Yeah. yeah, it's not set in stone yet, but there's one in Buffalo, which is too far for me. But um, Chris Robertson, the editor of the series, is trying to set one up in New York City. And, uh, That's still quite a trip. Yeah, Barnes and Note. Well, for for me, it's actually not that bad. It's and about four I, hours, right? Yeah, not yeah. even. Yeah. And um, Barnes and Noble, uh, they said that they have, you know, they usually fill up and they I'm sure have they do in New York. Two hundred and thirty yeah. seats. And, Great. Uh, yeah, so I think. Well, you're a good reader, and hopefully, we'll we'll see that tonight. Thanks. We'll be able to hear it. Thank you. Hey, I got something for you. I want to try something different. Uh, just a little game called Truth or False. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read two statements, and you guys have to guess which one is true and which one is false. You want to play? As so, sound like fun? As long as it's All not right. truth or dare. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not truth or dare. <laughs> truth or false. Okay. Just two statements. Okay. These are my two statements. You can let me know which one you think is the truth. I once had dinner with Stephen King. The second statement, I have a paranormal, paranormal ability, and it once saved my life. Well, Tony, um, since I don't believe in paranormal, even though that's what we like here, <laughs> we read uh, supernatural things and such, um, I don't believe in it, so I don't think you have that. So I'm saying you must have had dinner with Stephen King, which was very impressive. It's true. Okay. I'm going to guess that you have a paranormal ability because if you had dinner with Stephen King, I would have heard about it already. That's a good point. Sean. It's I'm too sorry. late. Your votes have been cast. You can't change now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, well, I'll start with the first one. I once had dinner with Stephen King. Actually, uh, I have a customer up in Bangor, Maine, and we went out to a restaurant called Pilots, and it's uh, located near the airport. And as we sat down and we were having dinner, my customer said, look two tables over. And there, two tables over, was Stephen King. So the statement is false. I did not have dinner with Stephen King. Yes. but. I did eat next to Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to see him eating a fish dinner. So <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. But the, uh, the true uh, p part of this, or at least it's, it's uh, well, I guess. I don't think it's true. Yeah, I know you don't. I was going to say, at least it's, it's true in my eyes. Uh, all my life I've had some sort of uh, feelings every once in a while that something was going to happen. Uh, some of it has been horrific, and I won't get into that. 
But one time, I had another customer out in the uh, wilds of New York, upper state New York, and we sold, my company I work for sold uh, bowling alley equipment to them, uh, gutters, you know, gutters in a bowling lane. We used to make those, and we made it for them. And so I was up there visiting, and we were at dinner one night, and he said, hey, look, can we go visit a bowling alley after dinner? They close at 10, and they have a problem with, uh, I think it was lanes 9, 10, 11, something like that, and they want us to take a look at it to see if we could uh, diagnose the problem. So he said that, and I felt a little funny when he said it. So as we're talking through the dinner, the feeling got worse and worse and worse. And I don't know, maybe an hour went by, and I said, look, uh, I, I know this sounds funny, but I, I don't feel right about going to the bowling alley. I just I don't feel right. I said, do you mind if we don't go? And he said, oh, no, not at all. You know, he understood. He, I didn't, he didn't think I had a premonition or anything. He mm -hmm. just said, no, I, I understand. So I went back to my hotel. The next morning I woke up and the phone rang, and I picked it up. And this was the dead of winter. I, I picked it up, and he says, Tony, you're not going to believe this. And I go, what? He goes, at 1030, the roof of the bowling alley collapsed, and it was on lanes 9, 10, and 11, where we would have been standing, where the roof collapsed. And he said, because you didn't want to go, it saved our life. So I'd, I, mean, I'd never forgot that, and I just remember looking at the phone and not saying anything for you know a good minute, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know I find you know I said well okay well there's no reason for me to stay, <laughs> so I went home. But things like that have happened through me throughout my life, and that's just one example. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still think about it; I get chills. Oh mm. man! Yeah. So that's my truth so or false. You don't believe I'm still in sixth sense. <laughs> uh, I guess not. Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't blame you. Yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah. I like reading about these things and as aliens do I. and vampires yeah. and all that, but it, I've never believed in It's healthy to be skeptical. You know, I, I completely understand. Yes. Well, I believe you, Tony. Well, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. <laughs> what do you got? You got one? Truth or false? Yeah. Got? All right. Um, so let's see. Okay. My two statements. Um, my first one is that when I was little, I had... Um, uh, two imaginary friends, um, and they were named Ghosty and Lucy, and they lived behind the door of um, my bathroom upstairs. And every time my mom would take me into the bathroom to give me a bath or, you know, use the bathroom because I was potty training at the time, I would make sure that Ghosty and Lucy came out um, from behind the door and were present and um, freaked my mom out a little bit. Um, but I fully believed that they were real and spoke to them and don't know where the names came from, but I... Ghosty and Lucy. Ghosty and Lucy. Ghosty and Lucy. So um, those were my imaginary friends, and they persisted for quite some time into my youth. Um, I won't say how long. So that's my first statement. My second is that when I was in my late uh, teens, I lived in an apartment building, um, and the in the apartment next to me, um, a murder had taken place, and it had apparently been two lovers, and one had murdered the other, and it was um, it was by hand, and uh, the man that lived in the apartment at the time that I lived there, um, that had moved in after the murder, um, showed me the blood stain on the rug that was left over from the um, crime and said that the landlord had been unable to get it out and um, he, he felt as though there was some sort of supernatural, you know, reason for it not being able to come out, and the landlord um, was unwilling to, you know, rip up the rug and 
just sort of gave a discount to whoever moved into the apartment and this guy was willing to move in and live with the blood stain so those are my two stains. so we got ghosty and lucy and we got a haunted blood stain i'm gonna go with the haunted blood stain as well yeah that's right hey are we good or what Ghosty and Lucy were my son's imaginary ah, friends. Ah, so it wasn't uh, completely false. No, and they did live behind my bathroom door uh, and kind of scared the crap out I'm of me. I'm sure it would. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he acted like they were real, and oh, I don't geez. know where the names came from, and he would describe them to me and, like, look at them, Ugh. and, I mean, that was chilling. I, I bet it was. Imaginary friends are really yeah. scary. Phil, you got one. Uh, sure. Um, so you don't want to hear the real story? Oh, that was a, wasn't the real story? No, you said the real. You said you guys guessed the real one was the haunted blood right. stain. Yeah. Oh, we were wrong. No, you were right. The real one was the haunted blood stain. Okay. Oh, so you're going to go into it more? You mean? Yeah, oh, you oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought that. I yeah, I didn't know there was more to it. it. Oh, uh, yeah. I thought it was the guy just showing you. It's yeah. Like, no. So. Um, he, well, there's a little bit more to it. The fact that I lived next door and he was like this big, really muscular, scary man. The and landlord of the, no, the, the guy, guy. That did the killing? Yeah, well. Oh, the guy that lived there. Yeah, he didn't in. do the killing. He the moved guy that moved in. in. Yeah. I got you, I'm sorry. And um, he used to exercise every night and I could hear him through the walls because the walls were really thin and he would be like huffing and puffing and I used to have to turn my music up really loud to drown him out because it was just so it was like maddening to me and I, it was terrifying because I'm thinking about the blood stain and I'm thinking you know maybe he's like gonna turn into a murderer too maybe the blood stain is haunted maybe he's right you know and I'm like what, what am I doing here and I was just a kid you know and he was like you know a man and I was living in this apartment complex and thinking what have I gotten myself into so and he used to scare me I used to come up the stairs at night and he would always open his door and you know, no, no. watch me walk up the stairs and so. That alone is scary enough. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. I'm sorry. Phil. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, well, I'm uh, pretty quick. I don't have anything as exciting as that. Um, but being um, uh, in the horror writing community, the three of us are, we, we meet fam semi famous people, famous people, bestsellers, and whatnot. Uh, in person at conventions like F. Paul Wilson oh, yeah. and uh, Tom Monteleone and, and so forth. Um, but um, I have uh, two quick stories, um, and they're both related to a podcast that I do. I do a Doc Discussions podcast, um, which is how I've met really everybody here. That's how I met you, Tony, and then that's how uh, I got into writing and publishing, and, and then I met you. Um, so what I do is uh, each week we release a review basically on something horror related, usually a movie. And uh, what I do when I write up a little liner notes to explain what the episode's about and then do a collage of uh, pictures from the movie and make it into uh, this really kind of cool type of uh, collage, I don't know how to explain it. And I post them on my website. And um, when the movie exists, came out, which is a Bigfoot movie oh, you that you talked about that earlier. She yeah. did, yep. And I didn't see it. I just thought you, of it when you said when I, that. Yeah, we're talking about Eric yeah. Brown, yeah. yeah. Um, but folks who don't know who, uh, who directed uh, the movie, it was a, a man called uh, Ed Sanchez, who was the director of, of The Blair Witch. And um, so uh, I tweeted out then, Facebooked out that uh, this episode uh, of the movie uh, exists. It's coming out. We did a review on it, and sure enough, a day later on the Facebook website for the movie, the the actual um, marketing page for the movie, they took my collage and put it as the 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 front page. So that's your first story. That's my first story. Okay. Oh. So <laughs> Ed, Ed I Sanchez this might not be true. <laughs> uh, so Ed Sanchez, the director of the Blue Witch, stole uh, your collage exactly and okay. used it to promote his film, which was possibly cool if it's true. Uh, the other thing is I, um, 
out of the blue, I was um, checking a toadstool bookstore out of Milford and Peterborough, New Hampshire, uh, to see who was speaking, because they have guest speakers every so often. And Joe Hill, uh, the author of n numerous books and Stephen King's son, was going to be there. And it was a last minute thing. I told my wife, I'm going to go and see him. And when I went, he was promoting um, Horns. However, um, I told him that I did a podcast and that if he had any items that he wanted me to review to um, let me know. And so he took my uh, email address down and when his prior, the next book, Nosferatu, came out, he contacted me and sent me a um, review copy to review. And so um, he's, I was one of the earlier reviews before the book even came out. So those, those are my two stories. Those are the two, huh? Yes. What do you think? Well, I know he has a copy of Nosferatu. Signed to Tom. <laughs> <laughs> That's a private joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I don't know. I think he would have told me if that's how he got it because we were talking I about I agree with you. Yeah, that's not something he would keep. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with number one. Number one is true, and number two is the fake. You are correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. However, I did go to Told Stu, didn't meet Joe Hill, had him autograph my copy, uh, but I didn't yeah. mention anything about my podcast. <laughs> but uh, Ed Sanchez did most of take my um, collage and use it as the front page for his large marketing campaign Great for you. on, Very on cool. Facebook. Yeah, so that was kind of cool. Well, this That's was kind awesome. of fun. We're going to have to do this again yeah. uh, in the future. But right now we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in 30 seconds, 60 <laughs> seconds. Sounds good. Maybe a little longer. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, feeling better, guys? Get up, stretched a little bit, ran around the block, and we're here. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to read just a little bit of our work, give you guys a taste of uh, what we do. We haven't done that since the first meetings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Phil, why don't you uh, start with a, uh, sure. a little bit of what, what you've been, uh, what, you, what you've written, what you've been up to. Sure. Um, I'm going to read uh, from the, the book called Bugs, Tales That Slither, Creep, and Crawl, uh, which uh, you actually have a story in this as well, mm -hmm. Sean. Um, and the reason I'm going to read this is because this is the story that I was talking about earlier that's going to be turned into a graphic novel. So Great. I decided to read the first um, page, and it's not horror at all, the first page. It's, it's actually very um, quiet and, and relaxing, to be honest. Okay. Um, I did prefix it to explain where it takes place because uh, I had it out to review for, to some people, including director Simon Rumley from England, and he thought it was a fantasy thing because he doesn't know... Native American names, and there's a lot of Native American references because it takes place before the European settlers came to the States. All right, uh, the story is called The Place of Strong Current, which is actually Merrimack translated to English. Yeah. And this story takes place in Merrimack, New Hampshire, where the Sohegan River and the Merrimack River meet. And it takes place, I, I chose the date 1396. Okay. Wazoli Keek stood over the river valley and scanned across the birch and pine trees below. Twenty-two years ago, when he was born, his grandfather had been given the honor of naming him. If the old man had known how well the boy's sight would become, he may have considered calling him Nahama, or turkey, for they could see further than any animal Wazoli hunted. Instead, the boy had been named for the day he was born. The, na the name Wazoli Keek meant snow on the ground in the language of his people, the Penacook, a peaceful nation that lived throughout the valley of the river known as the Merrimack, the place of strong current. His 22-year-old companion, Noka Kenozas, which meant deer under the willows, was a fair woman with eyes as gray as a winter sky. 
She bent down upon one knee. Her hand slid across the ground, lightly knocking over the recently grown mushrooms that flourished on this late spring morning. Wazoli smiled lightly. It amused him how such a juvenile diversion gave such joy to her. Noka quickly gathered up the fungi and placed them in her little deerskin pouch she wore around her waist. What a wonderful way to start the day, she said as her stale gray eyes floated up at him. Her mouth turned into a slender smile as unspoken feelings passed between them. She scurried on her hands and knees over to a moss-covered tree. By its base stood a handful of mushrooms that were larger than those she had already harvested. Wazoli brought his hand over his brow to peer above the basin below. The eastern sun was much higher in the sky than when they had left the village. Its angle hindered his usual faultless vision, though today's journey was one of leisure. He had never left unprepared for a chance encounter of wild deer or turkey. Nice. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But Very it does get darker. I yeah. don't, I'm sure I it does. That story. Um, but um, it's basically just a, a peaceful day Great. on some spring morning and before. Thank uh, you for sharing. Yes. Yeah. Very well. Sydney. Um, I'm just going to read the. Um, the first paragraph of Baby's Breath, which is transference. This is great. We yeah. get to hear what uh, yeah. you're being nominated for. Yeah. Which is in this? Yeah. And I know it by heart, but I'm going to read it anyway. All right. It wasn't because I didn't love my child. I did. But while my grief was buried under guilt and self-loathing, his father wore it like a shroud. He felt that if it had been him all along, if he had been the one charged with this blessing, things would have turned out differently. So he may not realize it now, but when I sew the final stitch on this makeshift womb, the weight of his stillborn son inside him will counter the void our child's death left. And when he wakes, the guilt will be his. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that was great. That was good and good luck. Good luck. Thanks. You're certainly uh, deserving of the nomination. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic story as well. Thank you for yeah. accepting it. Oh, well, it was great. So, and not only did I accept it, I had to put it as the last, because the last, if people don't know, in anthologies, the first, the middle, and last stories are usually some of the strongest, and yours was most certainly the perfect well, one to lead out the anthology. I mean, I just, you know, I wrote that, and, and a friend of mine said, you know, you need to turn this into a longer story for the Bugs anthology, and I was like, Good. how am I going to make this about Bugs? And then the wheels started turning, <laughs> you know, so. That's yeah. how it goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to read uh, just a couple paragraphs, something. Uh, very short, and this is from the novella I was uh, talking about earlier called Steel that I've been working on uh, with my, uh, my writer's group. Uh, I explained it being post-apocalyptic, uh, and it's about teenagers, uh, and the principal character in this is called Steel. It's a young girl. The world had turned crazy about a month before she had met Wise. She could still recall the feelings of awe and confusion when the deep red clouds had amassed. The thought had never occurred to her that it signaled the end of the world. Her memory of that first cloud, ruby-colored, perfectly round and dense, appearing out of nowhere and hovering over the U.S. Army record storage facility, was still sharp. Like a snapshot, the cloud had remained motionless for hours. Crowds had gathered to gawk while the local news stations rushed to cover the story. Rumors had been rife due to its location and its strange color. People had thought it curious that the wind hadn't dissipated it or pushed the cloud along with the currents. Curiosity dissolved into fear when the cloud had enlarged. It had blanketed the city. According to the news reports, it had, continued to it had continued to expand, and in a matter of weeks it had blanketed the entire world. The rain fell shortly after. Not the burning rain that now came every evening, but a slick, oily gray rain that had smelled foul and clung to the skin. There was no escaping that gray rain. It was as if it had a life of its own, often finding its way into buildings and managing somehow to reach everyone inside. And everyone it touched had gone mad, except for the young people. That's it. So, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Is this and your first time writing a post-apocalyptic? Uh, actually, this is based on a short story I wrote uh, oh. that was published many years ago uh, on a website, but yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. So now we're going to get into 
other people's writings. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes and talk about some of the authors of books that we think you should really be reading in your spare time when you're not reading ours, of course. <laughs> uh, the the uh, author I've chosen, his name is Greg Gyfoon. Uh He's out of Boston. He's an internationally acclaimed author of a uh, bestseller uh, of uh, uh, horror and dark fiction. When I looked him up on uh, one of the big book websites, uh, I saw that he had at least uh, 29 releases, uh, and those are from, nine, from 2001's Heretics to 2015's Orphans in Wonderland. He's got another new one coming out in a few, few, weeks, uh, few months also. Uh, Greg wasn't always a writer. He was an actor. He owned a promotional sales company. He was also an over-the-air radio personality, which I, I didn't realize. And I did know that he's an editor for Dark, Dark Fuse Fiction. Uh, you're probably all familiar with Dark Views. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's an uh, editor focusing on new acquisitions for Dark Views. Uh, as far as those 29 books, there's four novels you, I, I really recommend you read. Uh, one of them would be his breakout uh, novel, The Bleeding Season. And that was about five uh, friends who spent their childhood together. Uh, one of them, when they're adult, commits suicide. Uh, when the other four friends look into the suicide, they discover that the man wasn't quite who they thought it was. It's a, a very chilling book. It's probably his most well-known. Uh, Children of Chaos, I think, is another great book of his. And if you're a fan of literature, you might be familiar with Joseph Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Children of Chaos is a takeoff. It's a horror takeoff on, uh, or Greg's takeoff on uh, uh, Heart of Darkness. And you might like that. Children of Chaos is what it's called. Dominion, which is, again, one of my favorites, uh, basically is about a man whose wife was killed in a hit-and-run accident. Uh, he's mourning her, and one day he gets a phone call saying that his wife really isn't dead. Uh, he doesn't know what to make of it, but then strange things start happening to his computer. Uh, and what happens over the course of the book is he discovers that there is a link between the living and the dead. Uh, and the ending of Dominion is just something you have to read to believe. It's 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 got just about God. How do I explain it? You just got to read it to believe it. It's it's technologically involves uh, involves some quantum physics. It's just a, a marvelous ending. It's it's hallucinogenic, uh, ex existential. You're just gonna love it when you read it. But my favorite uh, Greg Gaifu novel of all time is called Garden of Nights, Garden of Night. Excuse me, and it's uh, published by. Uh, Uninvited Books, which is Rob Dunbar's uh, press. And in Garden of Night, uh, a man suffers uh, uh, just an unimaginable trauma. It's, it's horrendous. Uh, and when it, after it happens to him, he begins to see the world differently. Uh, he begins to have visions. And as we follow along with, with his life and what's happening, we're not quite sure whether these visions are real uh, or if he's suffering a, a breakdown. At the end of the novel, we discover what happens to the man. And, and I'll tell you this, and I've said it in my review, and, I've, and I've, I've said it many, many times. I have never shaken or trembled while reading a book until Garden of Night. When I read the end of this, my hand was just shaking as I read it. Oh, wow. And I managed to talk to Greg about it, and I asked Greg, or excuse me, I told Greg what happened, that I was trembling. And he said, Tony, it happened to me while I was writing it. Yeah. So you can imagine how powerful it is, and, and I can't recommend this book enough. I'm going to read a very short section from, from Garden of Night, Gardens of Night, and you might, you'll, you'll get an appreciation for the tone of the book. Uh, uh, Tony, I have a question. When did this book come out? Is it a oh, new it's book? Yeah, it's 2010 is the copyright, okay. so it's been out for five years now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, this is... Uh, just a very short section of Gardens of Night, and it's by Greg F. Guy Foon, and it's from Uninvited Books. And this is a man who's, who he and his wife are outside their house, and uh, these two people, two older people, uh, or actually an older man and a younger man, have accosted them. And this is the older gangster or bad guy talking to him. Listen, real good, boy. The older man gives a quick side glance to his partner. You move your ass and do like I tell you. Unless you want your pretty little lady's blood all over the nice driveway. Mark's mind races. How did this all happen so quickly? He can still taste remnants from their, their meal. Just moments ago, they were living a normal life. 
coming home from dinner. And then, suddenly, evil has found them. He looks over to his wife. With a demented grin, the man deliberately presses the gun hard and deep into the side of Brooke's breast. She closes her eyes but says nothing. Would he really shoot her if he fights back? Mark can't take the chance. He submits with a slow nod. His entire body trembles. Together, all four move towards the house. They have already begun to die. Oof. Yeah, I, and the, 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 the rest of the book is similar in tone, but as, as I mentioned, uh, it, it's really affecting when you read this book. Uh, uh, you just got to read it. It, it. It's that good. Greg Gaifoon is a fantastic author. Uh, this is my favorite book by him, but please feel free to search out other books. Uh, he's got a lot of them, and I, I'll be honest, I've never read a bad uh, no novella or novel from Greg or short story. Sydney. Oh, um, I chose Kurt Favre. Um He is actually the reason why I work for Villipede Publications. I read his debut collection, Forever in Pieces, and just fell in love with it. Uh, I could not believe how good it was and how beautiful the book was, and knew that Villipede was an extraordinary press if they had published his work, um, and that's how I started working for them. Um, Kurt has, uh, aside from his collection, he's had work published in Morpheus Tales, um, Enter at Your Own Risk, Dreamscapes into Darkness, and Midian Unmade, that new Clive Barker um, mm -hmm. um, what do you call it? Um, anthology? Yeah, the anthology, but it's a, um, what's the word? Um, I'm not following. It's the, it's graphic novel. No, it's like. Um, um, well, we'll get to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, and it, that actually received a nod in a recent review, um, which says a lot. Uh, and he's got work forthcoming in the Lovecraft Ezine, and. Um, his story, The Waves from Afar, in Forever and Pieces, uh, which appeared in Morpheus Tales, or no, I'm sorry, in Weird Tales, was mentioned in uh, Ellen Datlow's horror, uh, Best Horror of the Year, Volume 7. So that was pretty cool. And um, he's just, I, I don't really, know how better to describe his writing other than to read my review of his collection. But other reviews have said so many fantastic things about him. Um, he calls himself a purveyor of wonder and terror, the grotesque and the preternatural. Um, he teaches literature and writing at the University of South Florida, and he has his doctorate. Um, uh, he has had reviews um, on Telereed, and his work has been, he's been compared to Kafka. Uh, Paul St. John McIntosh said his style is mostly taught and contained, confining the delirious and atrocious subject matter all the more effectively. Um, he has a dab hand at pace and timing, progressively ratcheting up the discomfort level in the manner of masters of the genre. Um, C.M. Muller, who publishes Night Script and has been in Shadows and Tall Trees and Supernatural Tales, um, he said that this is a rich collection of dark gems, every bit as absorbing as Clive Barker's Books of Blood. Um, you he, got your own review of, yeah, of this, huh? Yeah, so, um, but, you know, he's really, received a lot of rave reviews Great. and um, yeah, I'm dying to hear yours okay Kurt Favre's Forever in Pieces is a searing and ap unapologetic exploration of futility his very purpose in the tragically beautiful arrangement of his words is to prove that on every level we are not meant to overcome we are meant to fall apart and his thoughtful captivating stories illustrate this truth 
in an impeccably somber literary performance. Favre's stark, intelligent prose depicts life, death, and everything in between as a harrowing and cataclysmic unveiling of our true nature. And yet we struggle against the inevitable collapse of all things. The weight of this burden is duly carried by each of Favre's characters. In The Waves from Afar, reminiscent of King's Beach World, a father bears witness to a coastal nightmare which claims his family and muses, it's an odd sort of atmosphere, this mixture of revelry and apocalypse. With a ribbon on top is a shocking yet credible take on an old conviction with masterful imagery and sinister implications. Even Favre's antagonists are bound to their destinies, not unlike his victims. The beacon stands waiting before him, all sigils and signs. It screams with the lungs of the, of the primeval cosmos. This meaningless cacophony is the most profound sound in all existence. It is hope and it is despair. It is death and it is birth. It is all things in beautiful concordant opposition. It is beyond reason. He barely even notices anymore. Luke Spooner's illustrations are a brilliant match for Favre's dark, evocative, and hauntingly corporeal portraits make the work even more unforgettable. Postcards from a world now undeniable, the option to return to sender as futile as the lives designed within these pages. In the binary must prevail, inanimate objects wage war against humans. More months drifted into the ether of always, and humankind continued to rest comfortably upon its puffy recliners and self-satisfaction. You would have called the state of the world normal, until the night of endless sleep, that is. The name was a euphemism, a thick layer of sugar, sugary illusion that coated the bitter bloodbath beneath. One man's blessing in the apocalyptic loop of may old acquaintance be forgot is also a burden. 13 more seconds until the second end of the world. The night was a perfect epilogue. It was all so meaningless. It was all so beautiful. Favre's imagery is exquisitely gruesome. A paradoxical beauty, however desolate, radiates from the bleak world he creates as though he expects his readers to follow suit and do as his characters do, to let out a sound that echoed between the pillars of horror and awe. The theme of anguish weaves seamlessly through his stories like a wire barbed with razor-sharp consciousness. It is consistent, compelling, and unmistakable. Dan tried to comfort her, tried to stroke her hair and knead her shoulders, but it was a fruitless effort like mining for sunshine. Favre takes all things to new levels, sometimes subtly, like ghostless homeowners in For the Unhaunted, or a woman unable to meet her ailing husband's needs in one unheard message, other times with a direct unflinching blow to the very tenets of our existence, such as his take on an old aphorism in Take All Your Troubles, and the onus of knowledge and critical theory. Even in Bolt, the sad tale of an unrealized baseball career, Favre heightens the effect of extinguished hope. He turned to the window and stared out into a dark void of undifferentiated, unlit, uncaring sky, land, and sea. It was everything that the searingly angelic brightness of a stadium in its full electrified finery was not. Birthday, perhaps the most unsettling tale in the collection, is nail biting, is a nail biting, faith crushing train ride to hell. The author's description of a hospital is suddenly applicable to every other structure, structure we occupy too. The whole place is a temple to our fragility and our inevitable degeneration. Death is in the mortar. Forever in pieces and a nuzzle inverted best reveals some of Favre's many potent allusions to rejection. Somewhere nearby, a vacant swing creaked on rusty chains, chains, singing the serrated melody of isolation and the colossal heft of cruelty. 
But the people didn't like what they saw. They turned away in disgust, probably fear. Some undoubtedly ran until he shifted back into a form that they could understand, a form in which they could easily find their preconceptions and beliefs, a form that, in some haphazard way, mirrored their own. Life must have been hell. Even in flash fiction, Favre's masterful grip on language and the power of perceptive storytelling does not loosen. Lessons is a terrifying take on parenting, and the imagery in crowning will haunt you, perhaps indefinitely. To use the author's own words, his ideas are like, like ghosts in the uterine, uterine lining of our literary sensibilities. This debut is powerful, moving, and has left this reader forever in pieces. That's great. I highly, highly recommend, recommend this book. We've got about eight minutes left. Okay. So we're going to switch over to you, Phil. Sure, sure. Um, well, um, for a while there, I, I had stopped watching and uh, reading horror and simply just did dark f drama and things like that, literary fiction. Um, but then I started to do the podcast, which I do, which is a horror podcast, as I said before. And uh, every so often, I would receive uh, emails from folks asking for me to review their book and whatnot. And um, one, one person emailed me was a man named uh, M.J. Preston, uh, or Mark Preston. Uh, he's out of Canada. He's a ice truck driver as his day job. And he asked me if uh, I would want to uh, take a peek at his book. And um, I said, sure. And a few days later, it appeared in my um, mailbox. And I was like somewhat depressed because now I was forced to read a book that I didn't want to read mm -hmm. because I wasn't sure if it was going to be any good. I hadn't heard of the author or anything. And at the time, again, um, this was had, the Equinox. Yeah, the, the the Equinox. Yes. And um, so what I did was uh, I happened to be sick that day and stayed home from work. And I put down uh, my Jonathan Mayberry book I was reading and decided to read this guy's book. And since I was sick, I could read continuously the whole day. And um, I finished it in one day because it was that great of a book. Good, good. Um, it was absolutely fantastic book. Uh, it's called The Equinox. Uh, this is um, actually, I think, the second edition of the book. Um, he, he does have uh, another book that just came out recently called uh, Katie Event. And this is a, a, th a thicker book, as you can see. And it is also, like The Equinox, a monster book. Uh, he's fantastic in writing monster fiction. Uh, the Arcadia Event is... Um, Aliens as the monster, and the Equinox is uh, a Wendigo, and uh, that's a, a Native American, um, or in his case, a Native Canadian monster. Um, and uh, there was things about the book that really struck me. Uh, at the time, like I said, I, I had left horror and been more into literary fiction, and this book I felt had a lot of literary fiction in it, or literary writing in it, I should say. Um, and let me, let me uh, read his first book here, um, the older of the two, the one that actually introduced me to Mark Preston, M.J. Preston, and, and it's... Uh, and we the both know Mark, too. He's a mm -hmm. great guy, yeah. He's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's a fantastic yeah. human being. Um, so let me uh, read uh, a little from this book and what I considered, uh, or th at least literary, the thing that really struck me, never mind the, the horror and the action that occurs in the book. Um, and this is, um, once again, the equinox. Derek snatched a stick up from the ground and pretended it was a rifle. He took aim at imaginary targets and began making mock firing sounds. As he entered the wood line, he dropped onto his belly and made believe he was an army sergeant caught behind enemy lines. Sometimes it was fun playing alone. You could be anything you wanted, and nobody made fun of you. Cameron could get that way sometimes, ridic ridiculing him or being mean for no reason at all. Just the same, he couldn't wait for his friend to come back from summer holidays. The tree line which separated his father's farm from Mr. Hopper's was connected to Spruce Woods. Spruce Woods stretched endlessly northward and was easy to become lost in. Derek knew this because last fall he had ignored his father's rule and set out, as boys often do, to explore the secrets of the unknown area. He had been up there deer hunting twice, but he was told never to venture into the woods alone. 
On the day he became lost, he had only intended on being gone a few hundred yards into the woods, but that was all it took. Before long, he became disoriented and ended up completely lost. The towering spruce trees overhead blocked out the path of the sun, and as he attempted to work his way back out of the canopy, he was actually venturing even deeper into the forest. By four o'clock in the afternoon, he decided to stop and wait for help. He had been wandering for five hours. Donald Wakeman found his lost son on the same day, just after supper time. He was wearing his orange hunting vest and calling for him when Derek stood up and called, Daddy. Derek, his father called back. Excited, he ran toward the sound of his father's voice and saw the flash of orange between the rows of tree trunks. He dashed through them and stood face to face with his father. For a moment, Donald Wakeman smiled, relief washing over him, but then he wiped his eyes and his expression soured. Get over here, boy, he commanded. What followed was a quick spanking, but the smacks hardly measured up to the three previous times his father had used his hand to teach a lesson. Nor was it the pain inflicted by the spanking that cautioned him from ever venturing into the forest alone again. It was tears he saw in his eyes. He had never seen his father cry, had always thought of him as indestructible. He knew that he had been the cause of those tears, and he vowed never to venture into the woods again. Thank you. Both those uh, books are great, yours and the, and the one you reviewed. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're uh, tribute was the word I was trying to think. Tribute. Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And all, all the books can be found you know, throughout the Internet on okay. the various uh, websites. We've only got a minute here, so I'm, sure. I, don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but you've got a final thing you... Uh, oh, yes. Um, we wanted to ask if uh, any of our viewers or listeners, because some people will listen on podcasts, yeah, yeah. Um, would like to submit any questions or comments or feedback um, or make recommendations. And if you would like to do that, you can submit them via email. Um, you can submit them via uh, our Facebook page. You can also send them to us on Twitter. We have a Twitter page, um, a Twitter account, and you can also send them to us by using our YouTube page. Um, on our videos, you can leave comments under our videos. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Let's hope, uh, if you do have an interest, that you do contact us via one of those four ways. Uh, guys, it's been a great show. Thanks yeah. a lot. We were a little bit rushed this time because we're trying to fit two hours into an hour show, and I think we did a pretty good job. Yeah, we did. I do. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Thank you. And we'll see you uh, next week, excuse me, next month in September, where we have some great guests coming along. Till then, thank you from the Taco Society Presents.